Knowing how to interpret migration data is a key to understanding large-scale immigration and emigration situations. A secondary key, though, involves being aware of how databases are created and where the information comes from. This video will explain the different types of migration data and how they're collected. Now first, let's talk about the different kinds of data sources used in migration research. Depending on the kind of questions you need to answer, large or smaller scale resources will come into play. Say you need to describe an entire country's migrant inflow and outflow for a given year. There are a few administrative sources you can start with. The most obvious source to consult would be the country's immigration authorities. In theory, they keep records about each instance when a migrant enters or leaves the country and archives these in a database. When possible, it is also useful to turn to government registries. Many European countries, for instance, keep municipal registries that keep track of all of the people, including migrants, in their municipality. This inherently produces a data set of all the migrants in the country, plus many other personal details. This can be seen as a highly in-depth and useful data set, or of course it can also be seen as a concern for privacy and security risks. For this reason, such municipal records are rarely available to the public and authorized researchers typically can only consult an anonymized version of such data sets. However, this can be a very rich source of data. The nature of these large-scale data sets results in a rather impersonal data collection process. Immigration authorities' interactions with incoming or outgoing migrants usually consists of a brief passport glance and a wave across the border. Depending on the type of data being collected, migrants may not even interact face-to-face -face with the data collectors. Take someone who packs up and flies from Athens to Amsterdam to relocate for work. Schiphol Airport in the Netherlands will receive a list of all passengers on the flights plus their travel documentation information. But upon stepping off the plane, passengers won't be bothered with any passport or customs inspection because they are part of the Schengen Agreement. Now pretty much everything said to this point comes with an unhelpful in theory tacked on to the end. This is because capabilities to thoroughly collect data vary widely between different regions and countries. Let's consider countries participating in freedom of movement agreements like Europe's Schengen Area and the Economic Community of West African States. Counting immigrants at borders within these regions is a tricky task because most of these countries' internal borders are rather, well, lightly monitored. If you want to know macro-level migration statistics for these sorts of countries, Municipal registrations would therefore be the best way to go since people not counted crossing a border would still be counted when they establish residency and register with the local authorities. However, not all countries have such a registration system or capability. But as a whole, most administrative data sources are unable to measure a key migrant group those with some form of irregularity or undocumented migrant status. The intricacies of migrant irregularity are fascinating and thought-provoking, but a talk for another time. For now, it's most useful to remember that migrants successfully entering a country, staying and working without proper documentation are likely to remain uncounted by administrative authorities and would therefore be excluded from administrative data sets. So that's administrative data. Of course, the exact agency responsible for collecting this information differs from place to place, and the type of data collected could be anything from border security records to residence permit approvals and so forth. The important thing to remember is that they typically have a large sample size by virtue of trying to count everyone or every migrant under their jurisdiction. The type of information they cover, however, is largely limited to demographic issues. Beyond the summary statistics of how many immigrants and emigrants are counted each year, these data sources may have information on the type of visa a migrant entered with, migrant employment or place of origin, and family members, and even sometimes remittance amounts. 
What would be much harder to find in administrative data are things like why a person migrated or how they send remittances. While we can try to give people as many options to tick on a customs form as possible, this is not practical, and that sort of response doesn't explain a migrant situation nearly as well as if they were surveyed. So let's change the type of information we need to know. Instead of wanting statistics on a country's total immigrant and emigrant numbers, we are now interested in why immigrants travel to another country and why emigrants are choosing to leave. For this, a migration-specific survey works much better, where more in-depth and possibly open-ended questions can be asked on migration issues. This introduces a practical constraint to migration data collection, time and resources, or money. Here we're talking about the time taken to access the person and collect the information needed, which costs money. Since administrative sources collect data from larger numbers of people, the time spent per person is usually a quick desk encounter, show up, drop off papers, get a stamp, move on, or fill out a form. Surveys, though, can be more like interviews. A type of survey that covers as many people as possible is a national census. These are usually the job of a government agency, but in practice are essentially a survey with wide-ranging purpose with a huge sample size. This costs a lot of time and money, which is why countries typically only do these every 10 years. Most surveys, though, have a smaller sample size that tries to still be representative, meaning that it is in all demographic senses identical to the total population the data is describing. They are usually meant for a specific thematic purpose, which means that you can collect a lot more information on one thematic area, like migration. That means all of the time is used to get as much in-depth information as possible on a given topic while trying not to fatigue the respondent. Now this poses a critical trade-off between administrative and survey data. Both have pros and cons. Rather than choose one of these types of data to analyze, researchers and governments will often use a combination of both types of data to answer their questions. To easily look at different data sources next to each other, both the United Nations and other organizations compile data from multiple sources. In the next video, we'll look at where to find these databases and how to use them effectively. Until then, be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already and hit that notification bell for updates about new videos. See you next time.